It's been pretty amazing to see just how much Lily and Michaela have been flailing around following the release of our recent exposés. I've even noticed Lily change her tone towards me several times throughout the past month, as she's seemingly having some trouble sticking the landing to her disinformation, something that's only going to get worse for her as we continue to provide additional evidence. Though, before that, I just wanted to take this video to break down some of the many excuses Lily and Michaela have already started making for Lily's predatory behaviour. As you can probably imagine, we'll be talking about some heavy stuff, so content warnings for the following topics. Child grooming, victim blaming, transmisia, embimisia, misgendering, indecent exposure, racism, white supremacy, and parental neglect. If you like our work and appreciate the research put into each video, please consider supporting the channel via Patreon. You can also support us by liking, commenting, and sharing our work on social media. Hi there, my name is Ethel Thurston, and we're here today to debunk Lily and Michaela's assertions as to why Lily's victims are magically to blame for Lily's history of child predation. Because Lily doesn't even deny the events covered in our previous exposés happened, merely that she's responsible for her actions and their completely foreseeable consequences. So as just mentioned, this video is part of an ever-expanding series of exposés centred on Lily Orchard. Our first video shared archived evidence of Lily Orchard publicly encouraging then-friend Josh Scorcher to groom Inkrose who was a minor at the time, which he ultimately did. We then follow this up with Glaze's victim testimony, along with an explanation of how Lily targets particularly vulnerable youth, luring them into a hypersexualized environment as a means to desensitize them to her sexual appetite. This was then followed by Mackenzie's victim testimony, which included a more detailed breakdown of parasocial audience grooming, how it mirrors targeted grooming, and discussion on why we need to prioritize a victim-led approach in our advocacy. So do check those videos out. So with that noted, let's move on to Lily's main argument, that it was okay for her to pressure a known minor into watching her flash on stream, since their stream was flagged as 18+. Indeed, since the second video was published, Lily's go-to defense on Tumblr has been to point this out, glossing over key points raised in our video. She then went on to repeat these arguments during one of her streams. According to them, Months ago, during, uh, months ago, during, uh, my, during the last stream where I got my tits out. Um, apparently some teenager managed to get into the, uh, managed to get, no, managed to get past all the warnings saying, hey, this stream is 18 plus, and saw my tits, and that is apparently my fault. According to this opportunistic turf, they were like, why is this stream 18 plus? And I said, click, fuck around and find out. Which is just like, I mean, makes sense when somebody asks a stupid fucking question like that. Like, why is the stream 18 plus? Why do you think? Ah, I see Lily has that magical amnesia that means she can't remember said events, yet apparently remembers them well enough to assert with absolute certainty what she said and the tone she said it in, because spoiler, what she just told her audience was nowhere in Glaze's testimony. She'd of course drop this act altogether once it failed to convince her audience, but it's fun to see just how internally contradictory her early excuses were. That said, there's a number of other things to unpack here, starting with the fact that 18 plus is not synonymous with sexually gratifying content. We actually covered this in the Glade video itself, touching on how both swearing and LGBT plus content is perceived by the current status quo as being mature or adult, in spite of neither of these things being on the same level as sexually gratifying content. We went so far as to note how, at the time Lily pressured Glade into watching, YouTube was being publicly dragged for flagging LGBT plus content and even entire channels as 18 plus because they touched upon LGBT plus topics. So there was no way for Glade to know the reason behind the stream being age restricted and whether it was for a valid reason or not. That's why he asked Lily. And Lily has even used this point in her own arguments, telling people that, you know I said fuck in a lot of videos that aren't age gated, you gonna pretend to be angry about that too? So Lily demonstrates a clear understanding that things as harmless as swearing and as life saving as LGT plus resources are treated as adult by a conservative and queer music society, yet she pretends otherwise as a means to justify attacking her victim with incredible vitriol, painting what was a reasonable question with ableist slurs. 
This is because she has no other way to defend her actions, all she can do is blame her victim for what she herself did. Even YouTube's Terms of Service state very clearly that explicit content meant to be sexually gratifying is not allowed on YouTube, which is further expanded upon to include nudity or partial nudity that's meant for sexual gratification. And yet, in spite of banning all sexually gratifying content, YouTube still has an 18 plus category, something that would not exist if 18 plus were synonymous with sexually gratifying content, like Lily is pretending. And Lily knows this, that's why she deletes her streams to ensure that they're never flagged for said sexual content. But keeping this in mind, we come to realize that Glade shouldn't have had to worry about this to begin with had Lily not been abusing the system, and yet he still showed caution, asking Lily why the stream was age restricted to try and stay safe. It's also worth mentioning that Glade, who remember was absolutely terrified of angering Lily at the time and was doing everything they could to enter her good graces, didn't detect any hostility in what Lily said. It was not, click fuck around and find out, as Lily is pretending. It was Lily, the adult, leveraging Glay's trust to pressure a minor into watching her sexual stream. Lily's rendition of events is a flat out revision of what occurred, designed to make her look better. Yet things only continue to get worse, with Lee openly admitting that she understands minors lie about their ages for a variety of reasons, yet seeks to wash her hands of all responsibility in mitigating that, in spite of the fact that, as stressed in our original expose, she primarily reviews children's media. See, it's like, because of the fact that, like, we all, we all kind of, like, everyone kind of accepts the fact that teenagers lie about their age to get onto adults' websites all the time. <laughs> but they cut, but like they they don't make the logical leap to base uh, that says it's not really your problem. They act like it's my problem to solve. It, it's really not. That's their parents' job. It's not my fault. It's not your fault that the parents didn't like really educate them on the internet, or like just aren't even watching. Like here's the thing: I don't expect like a fourteen year old to give a shit about any of that crap. I don't. Uh, you know, yeah. I I was fourteen once. I was horny once. I know. I, I know how this goes. But, it's not really anyone else's problem. Now, we'll come back to Lily comparing herself to a porn site in a bit, but focusing on the rest of what's being said, Lily's just openly admitting what myself and Levi have previously stated. That what Lily has done to minors like Glade and Mackenzie wasn't unforeseeable. Lily openly admits that she did what she did with clear foresight, knowing what the result of her actions would be, yet choosing to act on them anyway. If you choose to do something you don't have to, knowing what the consequences are, that makes you entirely responsible. It's also important to remember that Lily was not passive in all this, like she's pretending, a lie she's gone on to repeat in her more recent master post, which claims to debunk the evidence that has been brought against her, talking as if Glade was the only active participant in all of this. What these assertions erase is the fact that not only has Lily chosen to brand herself using children's content, but she has personally pressured minors, like Glade, into engaging with her sexual content. This was not a case of her stream existing somewhere in the far reaches of the internet, only to be stumbled upon by minors, Lily set out to make minors watch. Remember that this entire thing began when she violated the safer work section of her server, a place she not only knew there were minors, but others who had opted out of her sexual channels. And yet, even when a minor called the nature of the stream into question, Lily not only chose to keep the link to her sexual stream in said safer work channel, but she leveraged the trust she had built via her content to pressure Glade into watching. This was no accident, this was no fuck up, Lily has shown clear intent of action every single step of the way. As for the parents being responsible, I completely agree. Parents do need to step up, educate themselves on how the internet has evolved, and take a fair share of responsibility. But here's the thing, responsibility can and very often does fall on multiple parties. 
For you see, just as much as parents are responsible for educating their children on how to be safe online, the rest of us are responsible for not taking advantage of said children. Yet the underlying message Lily and Michaela are forwarding here is that it's okay for them to sexually prey upon children who have been neglected. This is neoliberal bullshit. Neoliberalism being the right of center political ideology that seeks to extend the principle of the free marketplace to all areas of life, including the family. That's to say, if a family can't afford food, the child should starve. If a family can't access private education, the child should go untaught, and that if a family fails to warn them about the ever-changing dangers of the internet, the child should be preyed upon by people like Lily. This is a political ideology I fundamentally reject not merely as a leftist, but a goddamn human being. We're all part of a community, so fucking act like it. What's more is, we can take Lily and Michaela's mislogic here to the most extreme degree in their favour to see how it stands up to scrutiny. Let's say the child comes from the most neglectful and abusive background imaginable. Does that suddenly mean it's okay for Lily to prey upon them, sexually or otherwise? Or, to phrase it another way, should a child victim of neglect effectively be punished for the failures of their parents? Fuck no. Lily is as responsible for her predatory behaviour as the parents are responsible for their neglect. That is to say, the failures of one party do not absolve the other. And let's not forget the fact that Lily specifically targets vulnerable minors with her branding and the topic she covers. Minors who have been bullied, rejected for being LGBT+, or previously abused, like Glade. That is why she's making this line of argument, because it suits her predatory profile down to a T. Yet it somehow manages to get worse, since Michaela goes so far as to straight up blame the minors. So not even using the parents as an excuse, but the very people Lily groomed. But yeah, it's just like, I've seen the people that complaining earlier about the blimmin' um, like, age gate streams, like, oh my goodness, how dare you? You have minors on your st- you're not safe for work strings, but you age gate them, you're not, and you verify them anyway, and it's, you're not liable, it's not your fault that they decide to ignore it and go on it anyway, that's their fault. Of course, Michaela is ignoring that Glade was not the person who created a community which is both hypersexual and extremely attractive to children, that was Lily. Glade was not the person who posted a link to a sexual stream to the safe for work section of Lily's Discord, that was Lily. Glade was not the person who, when openly questioned about said stream, leveraged the trust built via a parasocial relationship to corral a known minor into watching said sexual stream. That was Lily. What Glade did do was take responsibility, responsibility he never should have had to in the first place, to ensure that he didn't have access to any not safe for work spaces, and ask Lily a very simple question leaving Lily's stream the moment they discovered what she'd encouraged them to watch. Sadly, it was too late since Lily gave no warning as to what she was about to do. So, in spite of Lily and Michaela's incessant whining about how Lily, the adult in this situation, apparently had no control, Glade still took every precaution he could. The only reason he watched the stream in the first place was because Lily, someone he trusted to keep Miner safe due to her past work on videos such as Blame and Groom, leveraged that trust to get him to watch. What's more is, according to several of Lily's former fans, not only was this not the first time she'd flashed during a stream, but apparently those earlier streams were marked as safe for everyone. And if we stop to think about this for a second, It makes sense. Lily doesn't take action unless she feels like she's being scrutinized, at which point she takes the most symbolic action possible to pretend like her critics are making a deal out of nothing. That's why Lily keeps bringing up the age restrictions, in spite of her openly admitting that they don't work. Because when you're someone who primarily reviews children's content, you need to ensure a much larger degree of separation between said work and anything sexual. 
So it makes sense that the reason the stream glade saw was age restricted in the first place was due to the pushback Lily had received regarding her earlier streams. That matches Lily's pattern of behaviour. Behaviour that popped up again when I commented on Lily's actions during one of her streams. Because whilst Michaela claims that Lily age restricts her sexual streams on YouTube, that was already shown to be false in the Glade video. I came across Lily hosting a stream marked as safe for everyone, being viewable even when logged out, as she played a children's game. And she was doing so whilst prompting her audience to make sexual comments targeted at her, in spite of the facts that there were people in her audience talking about getting ready for school. And when I called her out on this, what did she do? Well, while she put on a show, calling me a turf. Another day, another pathetic fucking turf. Who is this, uh, who is this guy? Uh, Essence is, uh, is some weird fucking turf, turf channel. And misgendering me. Oh yeah, where it says, sexual comments directed at Lily or Fi do not fall for fr uh, friends or partners. <laughs> Whatever, dude. And telling me I was being reductive for calling a game designed for children a kids game. Also, actually, fuck yeah. Also, kids game, that's rather reductive, isn't it? Lily quietly deleted the line prompting her audience to make said sexual comments. Now, as stated before, this was not because I'd helped Lily see the error of her ways. She didn't acknowledge any wrongdoing with an explanation of how she'd avoid such incidents in future. Instead, she sought to assassinate my character whilst brushing the problem under the rug. Had she actually put anything on record, that would have created problems down the line when she inevitably backtracked once she felt the heat had died down. Because this is a cycle of behaviour. Lily is going through the same observable motions again and again. She's doing the same right now in threatening to ban minors from her Discord and hastily adding 18 plus only minors do not interact to her Tumblr, which is too little too late considering the fact that they're already in there. There is no magical switch you can flip to turn a community 18 plus when that community has been built on children's content for the past decade. You have to make a clean break if that's what you want to pursue. Lily knows all this. She's even had multiple people tell her to create accounts on adult specific websites like OnlyFans, yet Lily outright refuses. Why? Because unlike the hollow gestures she's making now, which do absolutely nothing to deter the minors already in her audience, meaning she gets to continue preying upon them whilst acting like she's doing something, if she were actually serious about mitigating the issue and moved her sexual content to a site specifically designed for that sort of thing, she struggled to get the minors of her audience to follow her. It wouldn't be impossible, but it would massively decrease her parasocial power, forcing her to take a more targeted approach to grooming, which is much riskier than parasocial grooming since it leaves a more obvious paper trail. And it's these things, when grouped together, that make a very strong case for said actions being deliberate. There are just too many coincidences, too many fuck-ups for them to be genuine. Especially when we have Lily admitting on stream that she knows the problem exists. This is why I am as confident as anyone can be, save perhaps a written confession, that Lily is doing all of this on purpose. Because when you look at the larger picture, these patterns can't be ignored, and they paint a very disturbing picture. Speaking of disturbing, we have the misinformation that Lily has been spreading since the Glade video was published. During the immediate fallout, one of Lily's supporters told her that YouTube requires ID from its users for them to access 18 plus content, which is a narrative Lily has run with, parroting said claim on Twitter before going on to repeat herself in her stream. Oh, uh, that's because the 18 plus streams are never made available. Uh, but well, suffice to say, you need to give your ID to YouTube in order to be here. And we get raunchy. Uh, okay, the thing is, in order to uh, access things that are flagged as 18 plus on YouTube, you need to confirm your identity with YouTube, which is usually either you upload your ID or you give them a credit card. Only problem is, this is false, at least in the way it has been presented here. You see, whilst YouTube has introduced ID verification in certain territories, the key phrase here is 
certain territories, namely Australia, the European Union, the European Economic Area, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom. As you will notice, neither Canada, the place Lily is from, nor the US, the place where the majority of Lily's audience exists, are included on that list. So Lily is misinforming her audience, mine is included, as a means of hiding her predatory behavior. What's really interesting is how someone even questioned what Lily said on stream, bringing up the facts that they've never been required to give any sort of ID to YouTube. YouTube is lacking then, I haven't done shit with any card. I mean, th I, as far as I'm aware, this was a new policy, so you may just be grandfathered in. So even if we pretend like Lily simply didn't check things for herself when she first heard said claim, which she most certainly did, any honest person would have checked things for themselves the moment it was brought into question. But that's the thing, Lily isn't honest. Though I was surprised to hear Lily admit to knowing that the requirements are new, since YouTube was only made to adhere to these regulations as of November of 2020, more than a year after Lily pressured Glade into watching her sexual stream, meaning it had absolutely no relevance to said case whatsoever. See, this is why it's so important to talk about the dates involved, because they always catch Lily out on the many ways she lies to her audience. It's also important to note that the fact that the changes were recent wasn't mentioned anywhere in the original post informing Lily of the change. So... Where did she hear about it? One has to wonder. Of course, myself and a number of people very quickly pointed these things out, with my own post on the topic going up on the 2nd of October, the day after the video. And considering the fact that Lily has commented on specific things happening on my wall at the time, there is not a chance in hell that she is not aware of this. So you can imagine my surprise when, in her master post which was published on the 27th of October, 25 days later, Lily asserted the following. 7% of my audience are minors according to Google Analytics. The streams were age-gated, YouTube requires ID verification to access them, they are also no more raunchy than an episode of Family Guy. At this point, it's clear that Lily knows she's lying, but she'll keep making said lie because she knows a large portion of her audience won't bother checking. Indeed, one commenter even stated, hmm, you know, I'm going to believe Lily on this because she's proven to be trustworthy and honest. That's a hell of a position to take considering the mountain of evidence to the contrary. Though, continuing on from the quote taken from Lee's master post, there are a few other points worth mentioning in regards to Lee's trivialization of the situation. The first of which is the way she keeps parroting this 7% statistic, claiming that only 7% of her audience are minors. This is a claim we've seen appear again and again, both on Twitter and Tumblr. There's two parts to this, with the first being that this simply isn't true, and Lily has already admitted to knowing that it isn't true. All this actually shows is that 7% of Lily's audience are registered as minors. Said statistic does not include the minors who have lied about their ages, many out of necessity to gain access to key LGBT plus resources. The actual number of minors is likely to be much higher, and again, Lily confessed to knowing all of this. So why is she suddenly pretending otherwise? The other part can be seen in the way she strawmanned the original argument with her pseudo-accusation, which read, Lily holds lewd streams for her mostly minor audience. Emphasis added by me. This is not a claim anyone has made, and I ask you to check my video for yourself and quote me if you believe otherwise. Though, returning to Lily, by including the addition of mostly, Lily frames that argument as hinging upon that claim when it doesn't. The actual argument is that Lily has branded herself on children's content, creating an environment which, on the outside, is very attractive to them. Lily has also made that very same environment hypersexual, which, when coupled with the previous point, is a problem. I'll say it again since people don't seem to be listening, 
the amount of sexual content in a space that primarily discusses children's content should be zero. What's more is, Lily isn't the only one with statistics. In general, 0% of my audience is registered as 13 to 17, as seen in the screenshots from July to September. This is in spite of the fact that my videos are not age restricted, this is simply the result of my more academic style appealing to older audiences. In fact, in the entirety of 2021, only 0.1% of my audience was 13 to 17. And yet, in the span of a single month after we published the Glade video on Lily Orchard, that 0 to 0.1% jumped up to 5.4%. Now, this isn't because of the topic, we've covered predators on the channel plenty of times before. In fact, we'd published such a video in September regarding Ian, aka Vorsch, receiving zero interest from minors. This shift is because Lily Orchard has been so successful in marketing herself as a person of interest to minors on YouTube. This is incontrovertible proof of what we warned about regarding the way Lily has branded herself and how it lures in minors. Said lure is so strong that it doesn't simply impact her channel, but any channel that comments on her. It's also worth remembering that percentages are proportional, a fact Levi decided to demonstrate with some simple math. 7% might not sound like much until you realize that Lily has 133,000 subscribers. 7% of that is still 9,000 registered minors she has lured into her hypersexual environment, and yet she's acting like this is a trivial matter. And just so we're clear, any number of children is too much, but the fact that we're talking about more than 9,000 minors, and those are just the registered ones, really puts things into perspective. The last thing I'd like to touch on is her claim that her streams are no more raunchy than an episode of Family Guy. Again, this is about her flashing a minor whom she pressured into watching said stream. That is what Lily is comparing to an episode of Family Guy, fucking child predation. Of course, as is becoming a pattern by now, this isn't the only time she's made such an argument, as can be seen in this clip. Some time ago I posted something not safe for work-ish on my Tumblr, it got some notes. And at some point, some Anon uh, sent an ask that a 16-year-old liked that post. That was like, what am I to do with that? It was tagged. You're supposed to stop and think about why this keeps happening and take steps to mitigate it, or at least Lily would, were she not a sexual predator. That's why she's presenting the acknowledgement of the fact that a child interacted with her content as the problem, rather than the fact that she has created the environment which causes this to happen. Also, just to give you an idea of the sort of thing Lily is referring to when she says something NSFW-ish, in the Glade video, we show dozens of posts of Lily engaging in graphic sexual text, encouraging her audience to write more, whilst also posting pornographic images like the one on screen, blurred for obvious reasons. All of this was posted to a Tumblr that Lily established upon the review of children's media. And Lily loves to engage in this sort of trivialization, something we pointed out in the Glade video in how, when I called her out for engaging sexually with the minors in her audience, this was her response. You're engaging sexually with your audience. Name five YouTubers who don't do that. ContraPoints does it, Jim, James Sterling does it. Sorry, James Stephanie Sterling does it. There's plenty of YouTubers who do that shit. Like, I don't think these, I don't think these fucking fre, I don't think these fucking freaks even grapple with the concept that it's not a crime to be vulgar. <laughs> Excuse me, ma'am, but you're swearing. She reduced the issue, which was her preying upon minors, down to swearing. And this constant reduction, this deflection that chips away at the actual issue to make it seem smaller than it actually is, is just one of the many ways Lily attempts to control the narrative. She refuses to address the actual issue because she can't. 
This is also why she uses dishonest analogies, with Lily comparing her luring minors into a hypersexualized environment to them modding their games to access sexual content or seeking out adult websites of their own accord, an argument she went on to repeat during her stream. See, it's like because of the fact that like we all like, we all kind of like everyone kind of accepts the fact that teenagers lie about their age to get onto adults' websites all the time. But they kind of, but like they they don't make the logical leap to base uh, that says it's not really your problem. They act like it's my problem to solve. It, it's really not. That's their parents' job. Reminds me of the meme where someone says they don't like sharks and they jump into a shark and invest in pool. It's like these people can't comprehend the fact that like if you come onto an age gated stream and you're not supposed to be here, that's not my fucking problem. Like, there's a reason adult websites only ask you, Hey, you 18, uh, hey, you 18, at the, and you say, yeah, and they go, all right. This is like a parent catching their child on Pornhub and then screaming at the website for being, uh, not safe for work. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> like, it's fucking hilarious, because, like, adult websites will, ju will just go, Hey, you 18, and they'll just say, if you just click yes, they'll just be like, all right. And you know why they do that? And you know why they do that? <laughs> it's all they need to do. Once they do that, it's out of their hands. Except, as already established, it isn't enough. That's why the EU, Australia, and the UK have forced YouTube to take further measures. Because when you're an entity like YouTube, a platform which has a sizable user base that are minors, a simple, by clicking this I declare myself to be 18+, plus, whether it be as they enter the website or set up their account, is not good enough so it very clearly isn't all they need to do. That said, I do have some criticisms of the way this is being handled, namely how platforms such as YouTube routinely flag PG-13 content as adult because it's LGBT+, meaning the way said system was introduced has effectively locked said content behind an ID wall. This issue actually came up again recently when YouTube pretended to care about the trans community for Trans Week of Awareness. People weren't having any of it, considering the way YouTube continues to police trans lives. But long term, I would argue that this should be the standard we're aiming for. LGBT plus topics simply shouldn't be deemed inherently adult. And the reason for this is that individual content creators cannot be trusted, something we have seen again and again with people like Shane Dawson and Anisian. And Lily is no exception. Now, I expect some people to bring up the fact that this isn't the case for either the US or Canada, and therefore Lily is legally doing nothing wrong, but as was established at the start of the Glade video, legal doesn't mean right, a fact Lily herself even pretends to agree with. This is also what made me raise an eyebrow when Michaela made the statement that Lily isn't liable, since again, both myself and Lily publicly acknowledge that the law as currently exists fucking sucks. The only difference is, that's like I actually live by, whilst Lily was just pretending as part of her show to make it look like she cares about victims of child predation. Point is, our legal systems need to be overhauled to ensure that they serve victims, not abusive people in power. However, this isn't the only way said analogy is dishonest, since Lily hasn't magically ended up with a sizable group of minors on her platform like Yuju. This was the result of Lily's branding, along with other choices she's made along the way, as explained in the Glade video. Keeping that in mind as we attempt to fix Lily's analogy, a more accurate analogy would be an adult website running targeted ads aimed at children, which I wish it went without saying, is not the same fucking thing as a child going out and looking for adult content out of their own accord. And this is a flaw that carries over to the teacher analogy brought up by one of Lily's fans on her Tumblr, which she agreed with, with Lily responding to the assertion that, this stuff is like when people get mad at teachers for having cam jobs on the side, with, lol yeah, just like that. Except again, no it's not. A more accurate analogy would be a teacher who is constantly making sexual comments in class, not necessarily targeted at any specific person, and writes on the board that it's okay to make sexual comments about her. Then, when the students go in to send their homework digitally, as some places do these days, 
The teacher's profile has links which direct people to her campsite. If any teacher were doing that, people would have every right to get angry. And to be clear, the issue is not the side gig. The issue is the proximity we've been talking about. Schools are spaces designed for children, just like Lily's platform is branded to attract them. Putting and promoting sexually gratifying content in those spaces is the issue, which is something Lily refuses to address, in spite of admitting to knowing that the problem exists. Getting slightly more personal, however, we come to the ways Lily has lied about my motives and character in general. One of the most obvious ways can be seen in how she's been labeling me a turf, both on stream, as seen earlier, as well as more recently on her Tumblr. This is in spite of the fact that, unlike her, I actually fight for trans rights on a day-to-day -day basis. I've even put everything on the line in standing up to legal threats made by infamous transmizics, such as former comedy writer Graham Linehan and transgender trend founder Stephanie Davies Arai, raising money to go to court when they attempted to silence multiple trans people, myself included, for describing the way both of them support the torture of trans youth in an attempt to turn them cisgender. Now, they ultimately back down, but we still have that money, ready to help any trans person mount a legal defense should they be targeted in a similar manner. I also spent an entire year defending trans participation in sports, in spite of the facts that I have no intention of partaking in said sports, because gatekeeping said sports violates numerous human rights. So I don't merely tackle transmisia for my benefit, I do so to protect others, something that cannot be said of Lily, as we'll see in the next chapter. Lily has also labelled me as far right, taking to Tumblr and Twitter to tell her audience that I apparently need to stop listening to Tucker Carlson. Lily even responded to some of the criticism she received over this, simply stating, Pedo jacketing trans women is pretty fucking right wing. Except, pedo jacketing strictly refers to not only false, but bad faith accusations of pedophilia, whereas I supply evidence of Lily grooming not just her audience, but specific individuals. This is not the same thing. The far right pedo jackets trans women because they're trans women and nothing more. I, on the other hand, am calling Lily a predator because of her repeated behavior in targeting minors, luring them into her hypersexualized environment, admitting she knows about the problem, yet refusing to even attempt to mitigate said issue. This is on top of her long history of sexualizing minors in fiction, including real-world child rape apologia in said materials, and even distributing non-photographic depictions of child sexual abuse via her work. More on that last one in a future video. What Lily is attempting to do here is incredibly dangerous. In saying that labeling a trans woman a predator, no matter the evidence, is a right-wing act, that leaves no room for any trans woman, period, to be exposed regarding their predatory behavior as an individual. This is in spite of the fact that, just as with every other demographic on this planet, some trans women are going to be sexual predators and need to be dealt with, preferably internally. Yet what Lee is trying to do is effectively handcuff herself to the trans community as a whole, screaming that if we want to hold her accountable for her behavior, she will take the entire trans community with her. And this will impact how people on the outside perceive the issue, which is why I feel it's especially important for someone such as myself, an AMAB trans femme with a background in trans and victim advocacy, to be one of the voices in this, because it very clearly cuts through Lily's bullshit. I think that's also why she's so terrified of me as a critic, hence her behavior has gone through several distinct changes since we began publishing our exposés. Moving on, another one of Lily's lies regarding my motives can be seen in how Lily pretends my main issue of her is the fact that she doesn't like the word queer, as can be seen in these clips. I still remember people getting like pissy about you over the Blimmin' Steven Universe video. The thing is, at the end of the day, it's just a video about a show. It's really nothing to get pissed about. If you don't like like what she's talking about, then that's not really her fault, isn't it? 
No. Uh, but they no, but they really want to make uh, their problems into my problems. That's like that, 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 that's the long and short of it. They want they want them to care. Like th th the thing is, there's no logic behind it. I feel like a lot of people keep trying to find a logical through line behind it, but there really isn't any. They just don't like me, and they don't want me to have ha to have a platform, and they want me to go away and shut up and stop harshing their squeeze. That's that's what all of it is. That's why, uh, you know, that's why, uh, that's why absence of thought has got such a fucking bug up their ass. Because... No, I have a problem. I can't deal with it like an adult, so I'm gonna let you solve it out for me. He's mad that I think the Q-Slur is bad. Sorry, they're mad that I think the Q-Slur is bad. They're mad that I don't like the Q-Slur. That's it. And people hear that and they go, that can't be it. No, it really is. Some people are God. furious when I, uh... Uh, when I criticize cartoons, and that turns into the into these dedicated harassment campaigns. They're just seething and molding all the time. What I'm gonna say on the whole Steven Universe thing is that I've never watched a show. In fact, my only exposure to it was when I binge watched all of Lee's content in November of 2019. Though I do find it interesting how, even when the critic she's talking about hasn't said anything about said show, it keeps being brought up as a means of discrediting her critics in general. Almost like Lily has trained her audience to accept these pre-established dismissals without scrutiny, effectively creating an off switch for their critical faculties. As for the idea that I'm coming after Lily because of her views on the word queer, not only is this false, but Lily knows this is false since I showed her evidence of this right before she blocked me on her old Twitter account. You see, I began writing my response to Lily's video on the label queer at the same time as I began writing my video on how fandoms can better support victims of child grooming, a video in which I shared my personal experience of having been groomed whilst in the furry fandom, age 15, before being chased out for blowing the whistle, age 17. This is how I ended up in the secular community, by the way. Yet in that video, I praise Lily for showing the support I wished I had as a minor who dealt with this. This is because I thought Lily was a good person at the time. Yes, she was rough around the edges and didn't hold back, but that's the appropriate response when you live in a rape culture. As such, my original video on the word queer was very different, with me telling people to not spam Lily with the video and even going so far as to avoid using the word queer in hopes that people like Lily would be able to watch it and find out why the label is so important to a sizable chunk of the LGBT plus community. And it was this screenshot, with the version or said script dated to December of 2019, that I sent Lily right before she blocked me and began hiding my posts showing said evidence. So she knows she's not telling the truth, but it's a convenient lie for her to make. Time for a history lesson as a little breather. The term queer was stigmatized by white upper class cis gay men during the post stonewall period as a means to differentiate themselves as the respectable assimilating gays TM versus everyone else. So working class LGBT plus folk, trans folk, butch lesbians, LGBT plus people of colour, all the people that the gays TM believe deserve to die of HIV. That was their actual stance, by the way. That HIV would wipe out the degenerate portion of the LGBT plus community. One such monster was Fred Sargent, a self-described Stonewall veteran, by which he means he and his boyfriend, who owned a local bookstore, kept calling the police on the Stonewall Inn to get it shut down as part of an attempt to gentrify the area. You see, the Stonewall Inn was one of the few places willing to serve trans people and LGBT plus folk of colour. Fred Sargent would later go on to become a pig himself, before retiring and now works as a spokesperson for the transmusic hate group, the LGB Alliance and has even publicly celebrated the murders of black trans people like Tony McDade. And here he is sporting an LGB alliance shirt whilst holding a sign comparing being trans to blackface. Which, if we look at this photo of the other side of that sign, we can see the LGB alliance's official slogan, Gay Not Queer, a slogan which they sell official t-shirts for on their website. 
This race, class, and gender separation is why queer has always been the go-to term for working class LGBT plus folk, trans folk, and LGBT plus folk of colour. This is why groups such as Queer Nation, a leader in the fight to tackle HIV, strongly identified with the term. This is why the people who fought against LGBT plus assimilation took to the streets chanting, We're here. We're queer. Get used to it. Winning the rights many of us benefit from today. Because they were not handed to us for good behaviour, we fought for them. We rejected society's demands, and we told the status quo that it will change to accept us, not the other way around. That is what queer means, that we will not change who we are for the comfort of allocisette society. And I bring all this up since Lily is at it once again, denying the facts that gay not queer is an anti-trans front, with Lily asserting that queer is a term of self-deprecation, when no. Queer is a term of self-respect, it is me affirming my differences from the allocisette normative society I've grown up in and going, these differences are okay. The label queer is no more derogatory than the label neurodivergent, and for many, the term queer is an act of radical self-love. And if I can take a couple of minutes to help a single member of Lily's audience discover that, that's an opportunity worth taking, since self-love is something many of them could do with a little more of. Reminder, Lily specifically targets vulnerable people, including those who have been rejected for being LGBT+. I think that's a big part of the reason Lily is so afraid of her viewers learning the truth about the term along with the movement and the history behind it. Because if they discovered actual political strength and self-love, maybe they'd begin to realise she offers them nothing. Now, it came as a little surprise to me to discover that Lily continued to try and chip away at my motives in her so-called master post, responding to the comment that Lily misgendered a trans person with... This refers to Essence of Thought, a right-wing YouTuber whose gender I was unaware of until recently. She came into my stream chat to hurl verbal abuse over me not taking her bullshit seriously, and I said, dude, fuck off. The chat then mocked her until she left. Now, we'll come to the misgendering itself in the next chapter. What I want to respond to now, however, are her claims that I verbally abused her, which is presented as either evidence or justification for calling me right-wing. For that, I ask you to check things for yourself. I have uploaded not one, but two screen captures of said stream. The first one was live from when I turned up, and you can actually see me type my comments, yet sadly that cut out, so I went back and recorded the entire thing again, worried that the video might have been corrupted. But in the second video, at 1634, I scroll through the chat, meaning you can see what I said after my comments in the first video, so do check that out when you have the time. But for now, allow me to read what Lily has declared verbal abuse. So I announce my presence by posting the following in action quotes, stating, Take screen cap of Lily encouraging her fans to engage sexually with her whilst playing a kids game on a safer work stream, to which Lily began mocking me, seemingly not realising that screen capture and screenshot are not the same. Thus I responded with, For a start, screen capture, as in video screen capture, is not the same as a screenshot. Secondly, you have it in the description of your video. Noting her prompt in the description. Lily kept spouting nonsense, so I repeated myself, noting, Just so you're aware, screen capture isn't the same as a screenshot. Also, it's an issue because I have evidence of you encouraging people you know are minors to watch these. I then added, Also, you've got it written in the description, before responding to Lily with, you knew they were a minor? Also, I'm not a guy. The final thing I stated was, well, it's good to have your reaction to the knowledge that you groomed a minor, because that was all I was after. Lily's reaction to the issue being pointed out, since that told me that none of this is accidental, that is actually by design. Yet this is what Lily is referring to when she tells her audience that I verbally abused her. Incredibly tame statements like these. And if you're a Lily fan watching this, surely even you have to wonder what else she's lying to you about. 
If me stating these things constitutes abuse, what does that suggest about the many other times Lily claims to have been abused by her critics? And if Lily had an actual argument, why would she be spending so much time and effort lying about our interactions to try and spin me as a hyper-aggressive reactionary? Lastly, are we ready to acknowledge how Lily is directly tapping into trans misogyny to cast me, a non-passing trans femme person unable to afford HRT, as this aggressive monster for pointing out some pretty general facts about the way she conducts herself? Because yes, trans people can propagate transmisia, including trans misogyny specifically. Which leads me to the transmisic elephant in the room, and no, I don't mean the US Republican Party. I am of course referring to the way in which Lee has misgendered me, repeatedly. Because whilst her master post would have you believe that this only refers to her calling me dude one time in 2021, I even played another clip seconds before this one in the Glade video, showing her reading out a quote calling me a guy, yet refusing to correct the viewer. Who is this, uh, who is this guy? Oh, uh, Essence is, uh, is some weird fucking turf turf channel. Lily has also admitted the fact that she kept misgendering me during her more recent stream, as seen in this clip taken from the start, during which she barely catches herself. Mostly just because an annoying little fucking turf decided to have, him, have, decided to have themselves a, a, a little fucking cry. This quickly breaks down, however, as Lily begins to go so far as to try and justify her misgendering of me, based on transmisic bioessentialism, framing me as the aggressive transfem whose apparent aggression proves I'm actually a guy. He's mad that I think the Q-slur is bad. Sorry, they're mad that I think the Q-slur is bad. I do not remember what absence of thought's gender is. And I keep defaulting to he, because all of his behavior is just like, fucking Vosh kind of behavior. I'm confused with some absence of thought. Ah, uh, just some fucking debate, just some fucking debate, bro. Uh, <coughs> their pronouns are she, they. Oh, okay, thanks. Notice how Azalee is called out on her transmisia whilst right in the middle of calling me a debate bro, she still doesn't backtrack, failing to issue an immediate apology for her grotesque transmisia. Instead, she just lets it sit there. And when she does finally speak, it's once again to blame me, the person she has been misgendering, for her actions. Like, they keep, like someone made like- They, they used to oh, keep I... getting on, uh, on my ass about me misgendering them, and I'm just like, I have no idea who you are. That's like, remember, you're, misgender um... you're misgendering me. Okay, what are your pronouns? Silence. <laughs> Does not compute. All right, get Please drive <laughs> I'm sure they told me, like, two years ago when they were raging in my stream chat, but I mean, I've forgotten since then. I just love how Lily is pretending to not know who I am, considering she said the exact opposite the last time we came into contact with one another, making very clear that she knew exactly who I was since she was still seething over the queer video. But of course, Lily can't help but try and rewrite history. Yet, even pretending like that wasn't the case, how am I supposed to tell Lily my gender while she's streaming at 8am on the 3rd of October Indian time, after she blocked both my work and my personal account on the 2nd of October? And speaking of said personal account, it is quite literally named Ethel Thurston, they, them, she, her. My pronouns are in my username, as they have been since its creation in 2021. How am I supposed to be any clearer than that exactly? And to anybody who wants to argue that Leek couldn't possibly have known the account was me, I literally introduce myself as Ethel Thurston at the start of every video, not to mention said info can be found in the channel description with pronouns. What's worse, however, is that all of this is entirely irrelevant, considering that in the trans community, it's accepted that if you don't know a person's gender, then you default to they singular. And Lily has shown that she's capable of doing so in clips like these. Why are people getting pissy at you? Oh, it's uh, just absence of thought on more, uh, on more fake ass tantrums. Just being jealous that I'm infinitely hotter than them. 
I can't remember what Absence of Thoughts gender is and I can't be asked to check. We also saw this towards the start of her stream in how she corrected herself, changing from himself to themself mid-sentence. Mostly just because an annoying little fucking turf decided to have him decided to have themselves a, a, cr a little fucking cry. So Lily knows this and can do it. She just doesn't want to. The cruelty of her transmisia, both the transmisogyny and the embimisia, is the point. This, by the way, is what I was referring to when I said Lily Orchard only cares about transmisia as far as it impacts her personally. While she rightfully gets upset when people misgender her, keeping in mind that her default voice is no more feminine than mine, she is more than happy to weaponize that very same violence against her critics. And yet the shit show continues, with Michaela making excuses for Lily that are incredibly embimizic. I mean, I remember, I remember like, I started like misgendering people because things, um, at my secondary school, I wasn't taught about like trans or non-binary people. All we were taught was about lesbians and gay people. That was pretty much <laughs> the long short end of it. So when I went to college and I saw all these like lovely trans and non-binary people, I kept on misgendering them a lot and I felt like a massive bitch. So I just had to really like commit to muscle memory to try and just... It, yeah, it is It is muscle memory. I kind of found that out with uh, the first time I met a non-binary person and it was just like, wow, singular they really just is not in my... It, like, just not in my muscle memory. And they were just like, you know, it, it's fine. It doesn't matter. I was like, no, it, it's not fine. Keep correcting me. I, I refuse to let this crap beat me. Oh, fuck. So you know, you know I keep getting absence of thought uh, mixed up with bite. Another freak of nature who got onto the Lily Orchard grip. I think I... Who's it? Oh yeah, wasn't he like a... A, a bro... Like a, a brony YouTuber? At one point of time? I think so. I think so. I'm not sure. It sounds like a brony name. <laughs> Except we all use singular they in everyday life when referring to people whose gender we don't know. When someone cuts you off whilst your partner is distracted, you tell them, they cut me off. When you find a mobile left on the side somewhere, you say someone left their mobile. This really isn't that hard. Though what's really horrific is that the way Michaela and Lily are talking here is identical to the way many cis people talk when they misgender a trans person, with them first apologizing before waxing on and on about how hard it is for them to learn something new, ignoring how, when it comes to pets, they seemingly have no issue correcting themselves. Only, there is no apology. It's just Lily and Michaela complaining about how non-binary folk are difficult and how Lily fought so bravely to overcome said grave inconvenience. Such an inspiration. Joking aside, this narrative is one which is recognized as highly inappropriate in the trans community. It is making out that the trans person is a burden whilst putting them in a situation where, right after being misgendered, they have to console the individual who misgendered them or look like a stone cold bitch. A lot of the times when a trans person says it's okay after being misgendered, like the case Lily mentioned, that's not genuine but rather forced. We often feel compelled to say that since, if we said anything else, that would be taken as us being unreasonable, which would then be used as justification for deliberate abuse. Our society has a real problem where people are taught that saying sorry magically fixes everything, meaning they often become very aggressive any time they're reminded that that's not how things work. That's why, when giving lectures and workshops on how to interact with trans people, we tell cis people to just apologize and move on. Don't talk about how hard it is for you, don't wax on about how you feel, and don't make a scene which demands even more emotional labor from the trans person, you just hurt. Again, much like defaulting to singular they anytime you don't know a person's gender, this is quite literally trans 101. So to see Michaela pull this and be supported by Lily is disturbing. Not only is it them trying to justify the horrific transmisia aimed at me, but it's imparting upon their audience an incredibly transmisic view of what occurred, something that will lead members of their audience to go on to hurt more trans people. 
And this is why it's so hard not to be cynical about the fact that Lily has recently reblogged posts about her supposedly supporting Neo pronouns. The fact that this comes so soon after her complaining about non-binary folk make the whole thing look like nothing more than a convenient PR opportunity used to fix some of the damage she did to her reputation. Though it's not just trans people Liz hurting, we also have to consider her usage of white supremacist language grounded in anti-black racism, as seen in this clip taken from her stream. But ever since I found out that some of these people really hate it when you call them TERFs for ceaselessly lying about trans people, I suppose the technical word for what they're doing is called tender queer, but they get really mad when you call them a TERF, so I'm just going to keep calling them TERFs. Lily then went on to repeat her claims about the term tender queer, stating that it was the current word for an LGBT person who bullies other LGBT people for clout. Which would be fine and dandy, were it not for the fact that none of this is true. Tender queer is a term invented and popularized by black communities online, particularly black Twitter, and refers to the way in which white and white passing LGBT plus folk have historically used their white privilege to exploit the LGBT plus part of their identity as a means of avoiding accountability. Misusing the language of social justice to frame themselves as super vulnerable or tender, hence tender queer. The most extreme example of this behavior can be seen when tender queers use their LGBT plus identity to frame black people criticizing their anti-black racism as thuggish brutes come to hurt the little white baby swaddled in a rainbow cloth. That's why a white trans woman can lie about police violence, raise hundreds of thousands of dollars under the pretense of suing the police, only to later admit it was all a lie and run off with the money, and people will continue to attack the black trans women who first caught on to her grift and became the target of said grifter's anti-black racism. That is how strong this move is, due to the way society frames blackness as being inherently at odds with queerness. That said, the term has also come to refer to the larger trend of white and white passing LGBT plus folk using that white privilege to avoid accountability in general, since doing so is reliant on the individual's perceived whiteness, regardless of whether a black person is the target, meaning it is a behavior reliant on exploiting white privilege and by extension, white supremacy. To give an example of what I mean, let's say we had a white passing trans woman with an extensively documented history of sexualizing and grooming minors who went on to accuse anyone that criticized said behavior of being far right, using the language of pedo jacketing to lend her assertions credence, that would arguably be an example of a tender queer as defined by black communities, since said action is reliant on invoking the individual's trans status alongside their perceived whiteness. Sadly, the term has been appropriated by white supremacists as a catch-all insult for whichever LGG plus folk are in the crosshairs at the moment, becoming rather plastic in the process. This has actually allowed a number of said white supremacists to invert the meaning, claiming that black LGT plus people criticizing white LGT plus people for their racism are the real tender queers, because in their eyes, a tender queer is anyone who criticizes white or white passing LGT plus folk, no matter how justified that criticism is. That is the anti-black racism Lily is directly feeding into with her disinformation campaign regarding said term. And it's pretty easy to see the disinformation when you stop and consider the word as Lily is using it. What does the tender in tender queer refer to if it's defined as an LGBT person who bullies other LGBT people for clout? It doesn't make sense, unlike the original meaning given to the word by black communities that notes the way in which white and white passing folk use the optics society has imbued their whiteness with as a means to paint themselves as the non-aggressor. A label with a similar history is cavern, which originated as a term to describe white and white passing women who use their white femininity as a means to terrorize and silence black folk. This described things such as calling the police on black people existing in public or weaponizing white tears whenever black people stood up for themselves. This is a phenomenon that has only grown in notoriety with the advent of smartphones, which has given black people the ability to record and post videos of white women 
doing said things. Think Amy Cooper of the Central Park birdwatching incident. And much like Tenderqueer, white supremacists appropriated said term, watering Karen down and changing it into a misogynistic catch-all for any woman a person doesn't like. Too loud? Karen. Demands respect? Karen. Dresses in a certain way? Karen. Perceived to be annoying in general? You bet it. Karen. And again, just like Tenderqueer, the term has even been targeted at black women standing up for themselves in the face of racism. By the way, do you want to take a guess at who constantly uses the term Karen as if it's something trivial and even outright comical? Lily. She writes characters to be Karens, claims her exes are Karens, and has even talked of making content treating Karens as if they're nothing more than a joke. Because there's nothing inappropriate at all about a white passing woman exploiting the murder of black children at the hands of other white women for comedy. And this all happened after she'd had the fact that it's a black term with an incredibly specific meaning brought to her attention. Now, I'm lucky in this situation in that I'm white, meaning Lily's efforts to weaponize white supremacy are pretty much wasted on me, unlike her trans misogyny, but it's worth noting that some of the people out there criticizing her and offering their testimony are either non-white passing or have other qualities that result in them being profiled as non-white. So it'd be irresponsible of me to not point out the racism inherent in what Lily is doing, both in appropriating the term and adopting the very method it originally referred to. It's kind of a racism double feature when you think about it. Now, I expect some people to point out that Lily has indigenous heritage as a counter-argument, but the fact is, being indigenous doesn't prevent a person from partaking in anti-black racism. Hell, being black doesn't prevent a person from partaking in anti-black racism. That's not how racism or indeed any bigotry works. As for said heritage, the only thing I will say on that is what people of colour have told me to say, and that is this. If the only time a white passing individual brings up their non-white heritage is when they're being called out for benefiting from and upholding the systems put in place by white supremacy, that is not a genuine or celebratory relationship with said heritage, that is an exploitative one, and that is all I will say. The last thing I want to cover is the way Lily is downplaying her involvement regarding how she encouraged then friend, Josh Scorcher, an adult in his mid-twenties, to groom ink rows while she was still a minor, with Lily responding to this fact with, This refers to Fire Rose, an awful real person ship the Brony Analysis community was encouraging that I was pressured to go along with under the threat of harassment. I was previously deluged with death threats by one of these people for not liking Team Fortress 2, and it had been the first time I had been harassed en masse, so I was intimidated into complacency. I immediately denounced the people involved once I escaped from that mire of toxicity and fled. The only surviving relic of this is an old post on Josh's blog, who naturally never reblogged the denouncement because, duh. My blog itself was purged of all posts in 2018. After five years, this took place in 2013, I naturally didn't think such an old relic would be dug up, but I guess you should never underestimate the obsession of a stalker. This, of course, is reference to our very first expose in which we covered how Lily enthusiastically encouraged Josh Scorcher to groom Inkros in a 2015 Tumblr post. Not 2013, like Lily is pretending. She even went so far as to preemptively defend Josh from accusations of pedophilia, responding to fictional protests regarding Inkros being underage at the time with the remark that she won't be for very long. This also supports the fact that this happened in 2015, not 2013, since Ink Rose would have been 15 in 2013, as opposed to 17 approaching 18, like she was in 2015. Lily then went on to further justify her comments at the time by reminding people that she wrote a book where a 15 year old ran off with a 38 year old, and that apparently her followers all thought that was lovely. This is of course a reference to the Stockholm series Lily now denies she ever wrote. Now, one thing to note about this is the fact that this was an anonymous question, meaning that had Lily actually felt uncomfortable about said relationship, she simply could have chosen not to reply. There's no way for anyone to see the inside of her inbox, 
So the assertion that she only supported said grooming out of fear of some sort of repercussion is entirely baseless. There was absolutely nothing compelling Lily to say any of this, meaning she did so entirely of her own accord. Lily went out of her way to encourage an adult to groom a minor. The power dynamics argument also falls apart once we consider the way Lily and Josh interacted once the schism occurred. Neither was the victim of the other. They both had platforms of comparable sizes, and they were both taking shots at one another, a fact Lily's own content makes incredibly clear. It's only more recently that Lily has up the ante, pretending to have been the victim of Josh's machinations, when there is just no evidence for that whatsoever. As for Lily's, I immediately denounced the people involved once I escaped from that mire of toxicity and fled. I don't doubt that any more than I doubt Josh called out Lily Stockholm. What I mean is, when Josh brought up Lily Stockholm, he admitted the fact that she had given him a cameo as her pro-pedophilia doctor, Dr. Scorcher, a fact Josh was almost certainly aware of at the time said story was published, due to said series' notoriety. Josh only pretended to take issue with said fanfic once the two started going at one another, like a white celebrity publishing screenshots of a former friend making racist comments in private years ago, conveniently glossing over the fact that they said nothing at the time. The same is true of Lily. She went along with it because she didn't actually see a problem with what Josh was doing, just like Josh didn't see an issue of what Lily was doing, until the knives came out. They're both as bad as each other, neither one abused the other. What we have is a pair of twisted people who had a spat and has since taken to labeling themselves the victim of the other, further insulting those they both hurt. Though this isn't the only time Lily has commented on Inkros, as can be seen in this response to a question asked of her by Lily Devotee, Streak of Scarlet, which compared Lily's past and present behaviour to a former smoker who now advocates against smoking. Lily then builds on this by asserting that her critics apparently get angry whenever she points out dates when… that's simply not true. Starting with the example Lily calls upon, that of Ink Rose, one merely has to watch the start of my video to see just how dishonest that is. Not only do I specify the dates behind said events, but I do so at the start of the third paragraph immediately after my content warning and a short three-sentence introduction about the pony community. This happens at 1 minute and 6 seconds into the video, before I've accused Lily of anything. Reminder that we were the ones who broke the story, so this claim that we never talk about the dates or get angry when she mentions them is flagrantly dishonest. We also have the facts that, contrary to both Scarlet and Lee's assertions, Lily hasn't changed. Lily's grooming of Glade occurred three years ago, a fact Glade himself noted, making it a sizable chunk shorter than the decade Lily asserts. That's on top of the way that Lily continues to brand her hypersexualized environment as kid friendly to this very day. In fact, during the writing of this piece, Lily has already gone back to marking her streams as safe for all ages after temporarily declaring that they'd all be 18 plus following the Glade video. So this isn't past behaviour, it's present behaviour. We also have to remember that victims take time coming forward, particularly when they've been groomed, since tackling that often means addressing the false sense of loyalty victims have had instilled in them by their abuser. And that's damage that can take years, if not decades, to undo. This idea that there's a time limit on calling out abuse like grooming when the culprit has shown zero remorse, reminder that Lily has targeted her victims since they've come forward, is a weapon of rape culture. This idea that if you don't speak soon enough then you can't have really been hurt is a myth invented to silence victims and exonerate their abusers. The last thing I'd like to note here, since I think it reveals why Lily's strongest defenders are the way they are, is the fact that Scarlet has publicly admitted to being a fan of Lily since they were 12 to 13 years old. Lily's current defenders have literally grown up on her content, 
including the highly sexualized environment, she has always maintained. Because whilst Lily pretends like said behavior is a recent phenomenon... I remember the days when Billy was a relevant character. God, Lolo, why are you, why are you here for so long? You're like 24, how long have you been here? You've been watching me since you were 10? 14-year-old me discovered MLP in a minute of videos, and, uh, and I've been here ever since. James, OMG. It's stuff like this that makes me glad I only became a, uh, a big public slut like two or three years ago. That simply isn't the case. Lily has always been incredibly sexual around her audience, minors included. To pretend like this is new is a complete revision of history. She has also been incredibly effective at getting such people to dismiss her critics out of hand, which is a problem but not an insurmountable one. A glance over the comment section of our last couple of videos will show you that we have already made it through to a number of her now former fans. But it is going to take time to undo the way Lily has groomed her audience into trusting her implicitly. Which is why we need to continue chipping away, which is exactly what we plan to keep doing. As it currently stands, our next video will return to Lily's arguments regarding Stockholm since not only did she invent new lies in her master post, but new evidence has also come to light, evidence which not only proves definitively that Lily wrote Stockholm, but that she was personally responsible for the inclusion of child rape scenes that were intended to be sexually gratifying, meaning it's worth discussing in detail. Then we have a video planned regarding video evidence of Lily distributing non-photographic depictions of child sexual abuse via her official platform. And that's before we've even arrived at the porn accounts containing further non-photographic depictions of child sexual abuse that have been traced back to her. In fact, we have so much evidence at this point that we've kind of just accepted that even if we can maintain a two-week turnaround period for each video going forward, we'll be covering Lily well into the start of 2023. So we just need you to be patient with us and know that we are doing our best to get everything archived and published. I just wanted to tackle these counter assertions before moving forward with more evidence because, well, look at the length of this video already. Imagine having to tackle all of this in addition to Lily's arguments regarding what's coming down the line. Better to have multiple shorter videos as we go forward than a single unwieldy one at the end. That said, the number of points covered in this video means that it's not only possible, but likely that we've missed something. There was a lot of bullshit to cut through, so if you spot a sign we failed to comment on, do be sure to let us know down below. I do read every comment and always appreciate hearing your thoughts on the matter. And if you appreciate what we do here and want to help out, please consider becoming one of our wonderful patrons who make all this possible. On that note, we'd just like to thank the following people. Matthew Kovac, Gerd Van Vorst, Hannah Banghart, Flynn, Higgins and Siegel, and Sosh Daniels. And from myself, Adita, and Levi, take care now.